He was very urbane, uh, sophisticated. It was somewhat of a front. He was quite a giggler, really. He was an incredibly, incredibly attractive man that, that flirted with everybody from, you know, from the director to the, to the cameraman, to the taxi driver, to the makeup girl. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. He was a workaholic. He just enjoyed his craft so much. How did Sir Humphrey know that I was with Dr. Cartwright? <laughs> God moves in a mysterious way. <laughs> Let me make one thing perfectly clear. Humphrey is not God, OK? <laughs> Will you tell him or shall I? <laughs> Paul Eddington was born on the 18th of June, 1927, in London. Although his mother was a Roman Catholic, his father's family were Quakers and due to the unsettled nature of his parents' marriage, he and his sister Shirley attended over 16 different schools. As a young kid in school, he'd have to stand up when they were all doing cadets and say, I'm sorry, I'm a Quaker. Excuse me, sir, I'm a Quaker and a pacifist and I will not fight. And for a young kid to do that must have required amazing courage. And that's what Paul had all his life. At the age of 10, he joined the Quaker school at Sibford in Oxfordshire. It was here for the next six years that he found the stability that his life had previously lacked. Paul's first job was as a window dresser at Lewis's department store in Birmingham. But his growing desire to act led him to a local amateur dramatic society. Soon after, he decided to turn professional, gaining experience at both Birmingham and Sheffield reps. But in spite of this, he felt in need of more formal training and applied to RADA. He was so far ahead of us, it was like a master surgeon playing with um, drama students. And I mean, we were in awe of him. He was so accomplished and so talented. And the extraordinary thing was, he, who was far and away the best of us, didn't have much luck, as I remember, and nothing much happened to him for a very long time after that. He had previously met fellow actor Patricia Scott whilst at Sheffield Rep. And in 1952, they married. Paul, though, was finding it difficult to establish himself as an actor. When Paul was really in the desert, not doing it all well, he had an opportunity to do a proper job. And uh, he was approached by Shell to become kind of some kind of sub-manager, petroleum manager, and Tris said, if you do that, I'm leaving you. I was absolutely alight with fury. And I said, I married an actor. And I gave up what I was doing to marry you. And I said, if you take this job, I'm leaving. <laughs> so he didn't. <laughs> Trisha Eddington is a remarkable woman. And I don't think for one moment that Paul would have had the success he had without her backup. She was absolutely the power behind that throne. She was the root to the tree, if you like. I mean, every single... Um, thing he did and thought and said was filtered through her. The first of their four children, Toby, was born in 1954. And as their family expanded, life on a struggling actor's wage was never easy. We had some very uh, difficult times um, financially for a long time, but he always managed to get work. He might give you another chance if you own up. A book you don't deserve is money. You can't claim for gambling debt. Now, oh, come on. You. Look, Mr. Dixon, I can explain that. You used your uniform for this. I had to have money, see. I did it first time just as a lark. Nobody suspected a copper, see? There's nothing worse than a rotten copper. I remember seeing him as Will Scarlet. I used to tease him about that. I mean, Robin Hood, Robin Hood riding through the glen. Robin Hood, Robin Hood riding through the glen. Robin Hood. Robin Hood with his band of men, feared by the bad, loved by the good. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. It was the first time we'd had a steady income since we left Repertory Company. I know how well you. He used to watch the rushes, and he'd come home and say, "I am appalled. I am appalled by what I'm doing." I said, "What?" Well, 
darling, they won't use those bits. And he said, well, he said, I hope they don't. But he learnt. Oh, well, I'd better be going. Got a long journey. Just to keep my new masters waiting. We'll be delighted with you. Give them our compliments. I will. Au revoir. I feel say. He never stopped working much, but always small money because he wasn't well known till he got into the sitcom. Then, of course, you know, people began to say, oh, it's Paul Eddington, isn't he marvellous? Good evening, Jerry. Good evening, Margaret. <laughs> Good evening, Barbara. Good evening, Tom. Good evening, Margot. Good evening, Margot. Good evening, Jerry. Good evening, Barbara. Good evening, Jerry. <laughs> when we first started The Good Life, they were kind of foils for us. It was Barbara and Tom that were the stars of the thing. And they were support. And in fact, the episode ones we all know, Penny Keith wasn't even seen. What the devil do you think you're doing? <laughs> we are dancing in our goldfish pot. Oh, no, it's a damn silly. What is it? What's going on? It's the goods. They're dancing in their goldfish pot. <laughs> he was dying to, to do the comedy that he loved doing. And John Howard Davis was the first director who approached him. And he had seen him, of course, on stage. I'd seen Absurd Person Singular, and Paul was absolutely, obviously, the right choice. Margot. Margot. <laughs> it certainly was a watershed in Paul's and Felicity's and my career, I would say, because it made us instantly recognisable, not only as actors who'd been on the television, because we all had before, but also as those characters. Why don't you just throw a bucket of mud on the floor? <laughs> Look, I have just cut my finger clipping your blasted head. Don't swear, Jerry. <laughs> and don't bleed in the sink. I just cleaned it. Well, I suppose he must have been about 40 then. And it put him on the map. And don't throw rubbish in the rubbish bin. <laughs> well, earth not. I've just emptied it. Penny has a very special style and it works beautifully. It's very, very precise and sort of chiselled. And Paul, though, he, his is exactly as precise and it's exactly as chiselled. Even when things were going well, uh, he would sometimes look terribly hunted and sort of... And I'd, I'd say, what is it now? And he'd be worrying about something. Paul would generally arrive first thing in the morning complaining about the traffic that he'd had to negotiate. Felicity and Richard and I all live south of the river and very near the rehearsal room. Paul had to arrive from the north of London and every single morning we'd hear about the horrors of the traffic, which was wonderful because John and Bob eventually incorporated that into the Jerry character. God, that rush hour gets worse every day. It took me half an hour to get across London Bridge this evening. God, I think that Friday night traffic on London Bridge is the worst of all. Best part of an hour tonight. If I get stuck in the traffic on London Bridge this morning, I shall probably have a nervous breakdown and I shall send you the bill for the damn psychiatrist. <laughs> Jerry was very put upon, not only by Margaret, but by that wretched Tom Good, who was really quite a pain, I always think. Oh. Oi, oi, sir! Haven't you forgotten something? <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, Jerry, you should. <laughs> we had a great sense of humour in common. We laughed a lot. He was rather more dry than I was. I was rather more clownish, as we were in the parts. You want one actor to be loud and the other to be soft. One actor to be fast and the other to be a, play a different pace. But for them to meld together perfectly and for the rhythm to stay and for the excitement to stay and that's to do with how two people work together and that's magic casting hello jerry ledbetter here now i was just telephoning to find out whether i could have my car today oh tuesday but what do you mean tuesday <laughs> be quiet i don't care if the spare parts come from mars go and collect them <laughs> A bottleneck in the lube, Bay. What does that mean in English? <laughs> well, say lubrication, then. Margot. Be quiet, Jerry. <laughs> when you get it, it's why, why uh, actors tend to work together. It's not because they lovey-dovey love each other. It's because they actually work together well. There was a time in this country when a date promised was a date honoured. And if you promise my husband that the car will be ready today, then I... Just a moment. Did they or did they not say that the car would be ready today, no, Jerry? No, I was just telephoning on the off chance. Really, Jerry? <laughs> I do wish you'd acquaint me with the facts before getting me involved. <laughs> Good day to you. Margot wore the trousers, definitely. <laughs>
ruled him like a rod of iron. Chair, please, Jerry. Shoes, please, Jerry. Door, please, Jerry. Cloth, please, Jerry. He got his own back in little ways. Whenever she went away to some amateur dramatic society for the evening, he'd get the takeaway curry and have a really good time and stink the place out. <laughs> Jerry was just adorable Jerry, not at all like Paul. I mean, Paul was not, you know, Paul as, was a very strong character, indeed, with very firm beliefs. The fact that he had the most amazing sense of humour. Wellington or Nelson? <laughs> <laughs> all the nice girls love a sailor. You'd better be Nelson. Ooh. I knew there was something about a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> Read your motto. We all fell in love with each other. He's one of the great, great, gentleman I've ever met. Paul was one of the rarest of actors because he was a complete craftsman. Throughout this time, Paul worked continuously, dividing himself between television during the day and theatre at night. It was while he was at the Chichester Festival Theatre that he first worked with a new emerging talent. I didn't cast Paul, he rather cast me. That's the first uh, occasion of a director being cast by, by his leading actor. He was um, headlining at that stage in London Assurance, which was going to be directed by Robin Phillips. And Robin walked out of the production after two days. And uh, John Gale, the artistic director, then said, you know, well, there's this young chap in the studio, you know, who you might find interesting. And Paul went, oh, he's, he's terribly young, he won't be able to do it. But he came over to see the show that I'd done, a production of Summer Folk. And he said, oh, it's remarkable, I'll have that boy. Yeah, that's absolutely terrific. And he took me on trust completely. Paul couldn't praise him enough. He said, this boy is going far. So I said, right, well, I'll remember that. <laughs> what Paul was was a miniaturist, I mean, a brilliant, brilliant miniaturist in the mould of Alec Guinness. He was amazingly still on stage and very, very dry and very, very well judged, you know, and that's what you see in all his television work, particularly in Yes Minister. <laughs> When he got uh, Yes Minister, I think uh, he really did revel in his success then. He'd really got there, and I think after 20-odd years of being in the desert, it was uh, a great, great thing for them both, for Trish and he. Well, briefly, sir, I am the permanent undersecretary of state, known as the permanent secretary. Woolly here is your principal private secretary. I, too, have a principal private secretary, and he is the principal private secretary to the permanent secretary. <laughs> Directly responsible to me are 10 <laughs> deputy secretaries, 87 undersecretaries, and 219 assistants. <laughs> Can they all type? He would rather have played Nigel's part, to begin with. 